morning. Welcome to the 2018 Convocation of the Waring School. Wonderful to see so many familiar faces and also so many new faces gathered here today. A testament to the ownership that we all feel as members of the community is the number of people I see today who have been here in different roles over the years. I see parents who have become board members, alumni who are now faculty, two alumni parents who are now board chairs emeriti, right in there, Tom Berger and Dick Prouty, and one special pair of alumni parents turned head of school and department chair turned faculty emeriti, Peter and Allegra Smith. Welcome to all of you and thank you very much for being here today. There are also many new faces here today who have come to join our community. The students are to my right and we'll present them shortly. New parents, you are no doubt sprinkled throughout. Faculty and staff are all here to my left and in this group, mostly, <laughs> we have several new members who have all been introduced to you in various communications over the summer and even last spring and may already be known to you. But to help you put a face to a name, I will present them briefly now and ask them to stand and remain standing until I've welcomed them all. Meg Ferguson Sauter, already a parent for four years and now also the school social worker. Just a lot, maybe we can hold the applause till the end. <laughs> Kirsten Trumbull, our learning skills coordinator. Julie Nelson, stay standing Meg. Math teacher, coach, and tutor. Harold Wingood, our new college counselor. <laughs> Jill Sullivan, alumna parent and now writing teacher. Anton Fleissner, math and also ancient languages elective teacher. Renee Becker, music teacher and girls chorus director. And Tim Tay, science and math teacher and tutor, who is unfortunately not able to be here today. And since he joined us last spring and hasn't had his official introduction to the community, I'm also going to ask Graham Pearsall, who does his work in the communications office, but is also running with Cross Country, and he's not sta he's already standing, but he's back there, and he's just getting a little wave. Um, welcome to each of you. I'd like to thank everyone who helped organize this day for us, Diane, Pavel, and Rob for the tent and sound system, students for assembling and after this, stacking the seats, <laughs> parent group chairs, Stephanie Patrick and Kelly Knowles for organizing and assisting Wendy Panchi and the group four parents with a luncheon that we are all invited to enjoy after the ceremony in the house. Finally, although my role today is technically to open the ceremony and make some introductions, with the Waring School ethic in mind, I'd like to just take a moment to share one very important idea about this school. It's not a new idea, but it struck me again on camping trip one morning after breakfast with a relatively trivial interaction. Nearly all the students had finished breakfast and left to gather their things for the first activity period. A few students were at the far end of the dining hall, wiping down tables, flipping up the chairs, pushing a broom around in a lazy pattern. A colleague and I were patrolling for last bits of breakfast remains, and he picked up a mug with a little coffee in it and asked me, is this yours? Then looked in it and said distractedly, or maybe it's mine. And then with finality and mostly to himself, it doesn't matter, it's ours. It's all ours. <laughs> it's probably gonna sound a bit silly, but I thought that was beautiful. I thought it was beautiful in its simple encapsulation of our school community because I don't believe that he was only referring to the shared responsibility for a little, a little mess left behind. I believe that he was really referring to everything. This school is ours, yours and mine. We are each to varying degrees responsible for everything. All school meeting is ours. We all sing happy birthday, respond to the speaker, lead a meeting. Science class is ours. We all share ideas, ask questions, challenge assertions. Chorus is ours, we are all attentive to our voices, sing with energy, know our parts. Soccer games are ours, we all support other players, compete honorably, cheer kindly. The console is ours, the walkways are ours, the trash and recycling bins are all ours. This event is ours because without each of us owning a small part, there are no speeches, there's no music, there is no tent, there are no new students' names in our inscription book and voices in our future. We must arrive here every day with the understanding that community is not a thing that we can hold or that can be given to you, but it is an ethos that takes form and that we share as long as our choices, words, and actions sustain it, as long as we realize that it is all ours. 
Thank you. The Richard Prouty Award is given in recognition of a parent whose commitment and service to the community ensure a strong future for the Waring School. The award itself is relatively young, having been established in 2004. The award is younger still because it is one that we give intermittently when we look back on the preceding few years and take stock of the people and events <laughs> that have had an impact on our community. Dick Prouty's role as two-time board chair, longtime expert in experiential learning and leadership, and now as a wearing host parent, truly embody the spirit of this award. Though this year's recipient has joined the ranks of our alumni parents, her contributions and impact abide. I met Vicki Lincoln when... <laughs> when I was directing my first play here at Waring, the core production of The Wind in the Willows. We were on a dinner break, and I came into the VH room accompanied by her son, Matteo Lincoln, who had written some beautiful and lively music for the production. He and I were in the midst of an incredibly high-stakes situation room discussion that can only be had about the state of a middle school play. <laughs> well, Vicki came right over to me, smiled her huge, wonderful smile, and said, you must be Elizabeth. I put my hand out and she waved it away and enveloped me in the kind of hug that told me that not only would everything be all right on the riverbank, <laughs> but also that I would find my second home here in the Waring community. Vicki had made enough veggie chili with thoughtful accompaniments <laughs> for an actual army and in this case a forest full of starving preteen woodland creatures. <laughs> Vicki vis visited with each participant and made sure that each toad, rat, rabbit, mole, badger, otter, weasel, ferret, and fox was fueled and happy and ready to return to rehearsal. Vicki has fueled wearing in so many ways by celebrating what is best about us while always encouraging us to realize our full potential. As parent co-group chair from 2013 to 2015, Vicki organized, rallied, led, and inspired our community, sometimes through uncertain times. Vicki has been an eloquent spokesperson on behalf of Waring and has enhanced our admissions and college counseling processes. As the co-founder of our faculty grants program, Vicki has worked tirelessly to ensure that Waring School faculty members will have the resources to challenge and enrich ourselves and to continually fuel our passions so that we may truly give our best to our students so that we may guide them as they discover their own passions. We thank you, Vicki, for your generosity of spirit, your incredible kindness, your guidance, and your steadfast care. On behalf of Waring School, I am honored to present the Richard Prouty Award to alumni, parent, and dear friend, Vicki Lincoln. that got me here today, so um, <laughs> apparently my son is not performing. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so I, I, I obviously don't have 
any, I don't have, wow, okay. <laughs> um, I do just have to say one thing, though. No. Um, this honor is shared by um, all the parents at Waring uh, who came before me, um, who taught me what it means to give back to a community as completely as we do at Waring. This is a shout out to my friend Mary Cookson, among others. Um, but it means that anything that I did at this school is a complete collaborative effort. And um, I guess what I would love to say to the new parents who are here today is uh, dive in. Um, embrace this school, this community. It gives back in spades. And you will learn this over your years of being here. Um, we love this place from the bottom of our hearts, and it has given back to me and to my family far more than I ever gave out to the school. So, thank you very much. it says breathe. <laughs> Thank you. I am grateful to be part of a community that loves me enough to send me away for a semester. A community that recognizes in this tangible way the value of being apart from the ordinary to refresh and restore. I had a sabbatical leave last spring. I think most of you know that. My family, my mother, my husband Jason, my children and my in-laws appreciated those months of having me around to participate and to help out when they needed me. It was my privilege to use some time for professional development at two outstanding math teacher workshops. Far and away, however, the exceptional opportunity of my sabbatical was an eight-week adventure in New Zealand. Jason and I traveled with our boys, Loban and Kepler, who are seven and five years old. When I came back to Waring, people asked me, does it feel like you never left? No. <laughs> I have new riches of experience. We built faith that we can walk together through challenges and through our personal quirks and emerge into joy, wonder, and awe. On the Abel Tasman track at the northeastern corner of the South Island, we embarked on one of many backpacking excursions. Road conditions forced us to arrive at this remote trailhead only a half hour before sunset. But the track across the headlands to our beach campsite was short, only three kilometers, so we adults shouldered the big packs, took our boys by the hands, and struck out. The moon rose in a sliver over a meadow scented with herbs as we crossed under a pinkening sky. After a long day in the car, the little boys were eager to move fast. Once in among the palms and the tree ferns, however, shadows grew deeper and even the clearings offered less light. I felt little Kepler grip my hand more tightly and his questions grew increasingly anxious. I had just begun to hear the breakers and knew we weren't far when he burst into tears. I tried all my soothing mama tricks, but he wouldn't have any of it. Around a corner, I caught sight of tiny pricks of light beneath a rocky overhang about shoulder level. In that instant, I remembered this marvel of New Zealand's insect community, glowworms. Kepler, I said, stopping short. Startled, he sniffled at me. What? <laughs> Look, I said, hoisting him up to my hip. He recoiled, confused, and scared, and buried his head in my shoulder. Glowworms, I said, beaming at him. Tons of them, look. I stepped us closer, and reluctantly he turned to see. After a moment, I heard a giggle. Glowworms? I could hear the surprise and delight in his voice as he wondered how a worm might make a light. Behind us, I heard Jason and Loban approaching. 
Jason, I said, and I knew he could hear me smiling. Glowworms. He drew Loban in and pointed up under the limestone. We stopped for a long moment to admire this tiny constellation twinkling like a second sky and listen to the boys laugh in wonder, tears forgotten. It was hard to leave that spot, but the sound of the waves on the beachfront lured us forward to find our campsite on Anapai Bay. Familiar routines of setting up our tent and, and camp kitchen went quickly and toasting quesadillas on the, whips, on the whisper light took only a few minutes. We sat in the warm night around a picnic table, actually a rare luxury in the New Zealand camping world, and told our story back to each other before crawling into the tent for a long sleep. Over and over on our adventure, we experienced this pattern of pushing through into transcendence. The weather, someone's mood, the terrain, or some circumstance would derive us into frustration or worry. And we'd make that choice to stay in the work, to not give up for an easier, softer way, and then emerge into something worthwhile. But haven't we seen that together, Warren? In N-term? In science class? As a community? Math students. Runners, writers, parents, I invite you to share in this practice as often as we wish. Hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Priscilla Malba. I'm the proud parent of a member of the graduating class this year, as well as a member of the Board of Trustees of this great school. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you today, but I have to set expectations up front. I hate public speaking, like a root canal. Uh, but with, <laughs> with that said, here we go. <clears throat> I'm happy to add my voice to those welcoming, welcoming you to Waring today. From my perspective, not only has this school provided a strong academic framework for my daughter, Sarah, but more importantly, it has been an extended family that she and I have needed and relied upon. Our family lost my husband, Steve, Sarah's father, when he died unexpectedly in 2013. That has taken its toll, but the Waring family has been there with us at once being a shoulder to lean on and giving us the space in which to find our bearings. We rise together here at Waring as a community to support each other, to meet challenges together, and to celebrate each other. And these are some of the many ways in which Waring distinguishes itself as a place of learning. The faculty and staff at this school work with the students in the trenches, challenging each other to tease out the heart of their assignments. The students somehow innately know that no more is being asked of them or expected of them than what Waring asks and expects of itself. And therein lies the seeds of trust. School and student working together and over the years, it enables these kids to not only find their voices, but to trust their instincts. But those attending classes are not the only students of Waring. During Sarah's trip to Angers in 2016, there was a horrendous terrorist attack at the airport in Brussels. I was in email communication with Yasmin Fraser, as I'm sure most, if not all, parents were and realized then that Waring had been preparing me for a moment such as this. I thought, in our family, Sarah is not the only student of Waring. I am too. And as a student of Waring, I needed to understand and trust that although she and I were in touch by Skype, Sarah and I were both learning that she could manage this on her own. How does Waring do it? Beginning with core trip 
to Montreal and the realization that students will not always be in the company of an adult. They rise to that challenge and we as parents need to also. And then watching young ninth graders go through security at the airport on their way to a month in France. And then comes junior trip, the mother of all interns. <laughs> Three weeks in France without you. You wake up and you find that the kid you've been dropping off at school, hopefully before eight, <laughs> is packing her own bag uh, ticking off her own checklist, uh, making her own clothing choices, though I would, you know, hard as it was for me to stand back from that, okay. <laughs> All very matter-of-factly preparing for three weeks without you. As parents, wearing helps us to learn how to stand back, to let go, to let them carve their own paths. And when college comes, we're ready confident knowing that they are well prepared for their futures. As I watch Sarah and her classmates take on their last year of high school, I know she is eager to embrace her future as I am with her. Mostly, that is. I still have a few months of wearing to help me learn into that eventuality. So welcome families to Waring. You've made a terrific choice of school for your children and for yourselves. Thank you. Jacqueline Rothman in New Hampshire. Now our camping trip for the past few times, Cordelia and Delaria have loved their instruments up so that they could play with the band. And so they have and have enjoyed it very much and Jacqueline has enjoyed having them. <laughs> Typically at the end of a country dance, although we didn't get to it this year, it was so hot. But typically a country dance will end with a beautiful lyrical waltz. This waltz was written by one of Jacqueline's students and now is played by one of ours. This time, ja um, Cordelia is the soloist in the band.
imagine having an incurable disease for seven years, a time-consuming chronic condition with daily treatments. Over time, this disease challenges your pre-existing beliefs, thoughts, and outlook on life. Over six years ago, I came to this school and contracted wearing itis. <laughs> Within a week of my initial exposure, I began to see symptoms that would be reportable in any adolescent practice. I was suddenly motivated to make the most extravagant visuals for books like Donald Duck and The Good Earth. I was restless, and I stayed up past the core bedtime, making a simulation of a rice field just for a humanities discussion. Every day, I feverishly looked forward to French class in a basement where our young voices screeched La Vie en Rose for the entire campus to hear without yet knowing what we were saying. <laughs> it wasn't long until I realized my disease was an epidemic. My entire grade had fallen ill with wearing itis. Symptoms included breaking out in note cards, a rash of overwrought visual assignments, a persistent love for and desire to resubmit math problems for John Barrick until we got them perfect, and an itchiness to run extra suicides at practice. The illness spread like fire on a dried up soccer field. By eighth grade, my case had worsened. I was delirious to do everything on campus, and my peers were no different. I was in debate club, math team, orchestra, ensembles, a play, and three sports. Despite this affliction, my classmates and I quickly mastered how to manage time and priorities. I learned how to question and participate in discussions and to advocate for my own education. We began to link ideas across disciplines. I knew I was serious when I left for France as a high school freshman, spending an entire month in a country across the sea, living with a family of strangers who did not speak English. But we weren't nervous, just excited. In Angers, I ended up flying in a plane smaller than our family car at 20,000 feet with my host father as the pilot. <laughs> Wearing Idos was making us strangely comfortable taking risks. Every soiree infused me with a need to be better. My trembling 11-year-old arms that used to add unwanted vibrato to the violin became more and more confident as the number of performances multiplied. Coffee houses and dance planning masked the great bonding developing underneath. And terms with 12-hour bus rides to Baltimore, dancing with the Bolivian soccer team at Copa America, and putting on vaudeville shows in nursing homes all tested our character and charisma. Junior year, we went eagerly to Francis's physics class. In humanities, Joshua's, you don't know what you know, you don't know you know, slowly made sense to us. Very little sense, but still some. <laughs> Topics from debate metastasized into every class like a tumor. Tim Averill's lit class transfigured into life advice class. By the time we became upperclassmen, everyone had an irrational desire to be a teaching assistant in some subject at Waring. That's when Waring Itis was full blown. It really was viral. Why did I love these people and this place so much? The daily conversations with Diane and Pavel, the smiles from Mrs. Cahill as I rushed to class at 7.59, tutors like Mike and Colleen who cared more about my overall health than I did, it is all so contagious. To those of you about to be infected, embrace wearing itis through contact with the wearing community. It is everywhere. Vectors include your teachers, coaches, administrative staff, and classmates. Trust me, this is one disease I hope they never find the cure for. Am I going to need to adjust this? Yes? Good thing I have a captive audience. When I was just beginning here in the eighth grade, awkward, clumsy, and a little bit too tall, a lot like today, the faces around me seemed immortal. I struggled to fill in the blanks about this strange new place, and I wrote what I saw in stone. Henry Mitchell is a senior. My sister Autumn is a sophomore. Graham teaches math. Mel is the head of school, Inca works in the office with Mrs. Cahill, and of course our darling Dorothy Wang will always be there to give me a hug and a kind word when I need it. Those of you new to wearing won't recognize these people, and perhaps you've never even heard their names. But in eighth grade, they were the only wearing I knew. When I came back as a ninth grader, I looked around and I was shook. The school was mostly the same, but it felt like everything was different. Mel, Inca, Dorothy, and Henry were all gone, and now there were new kids who were even newer than I was. And the same thing the next year. Andrew, Jack, and Graham were all leaving, and I knew that soon I would be helping pack my sister's room and send her off to Kalamazoo, as even more unfamiliar faces filled the Waring campus. What happened to the school I used to know? I don't think I've attended the same school two years in a row. 
Our culture has been shaped by the beautiful, critical voices who have passed through here. New students, parents, and teachers come in with their own insights. As they spend time here, those insights illuminate our shortcomings. If we can listen to those critical voices among us, we can be better than we are today. We've listened to students like Asher Leahy, who started wearing his queer club because he knew that inclusion takes more effort than tolerance. We've listened to students like Julia Natale, who not only sank six threes in a row on the court, but also campaigned for equal recognition of women's sports. We've listened to students like Laura Miller, Lily Wildrick, Elizabeth Ward, and the countless others who fought to open a dialogue about gender and sexism in the wearing community. These students are no longer here, but their legacies live on to remind us that this is a brand new year, and we do not have to accept the world as we see it. This year I knew what to expect, and while I was saddened watching old friends and teachers leave this little commune, I was excited to see the fresh and young and old faces <laughs> that have joined us. <laughs> Love you guys. New students. Perhaps you see wearing now the way I saw it in eighth grade. Tim is the head of school, Mrs. Cahill runs the front desk, and this small class of 23 seniors are the seniors. As we leave, we pass the school on to you. A fair share for all. Do what you can with it. This place will change if you let it. Do not accept the school as it is, but make it accept you as you are. The wearing we leave to you does not have to be the wearing you give the next generation. Make us smarter, make us fairer, and above all, make us kinder. Thank you. For months now, I've had my graduation speech completely planned in my head. That being said, I'm not funny, so the four jokes that I do have will all be included in that speech. <laughs> Sorry. I thought that maybe I could talk to you all about my first camping trip, but then decided that no one would be interested in hearing about how hard I tried to fit in before I realized that fitting in is totally uncool and completely unwearing. My next thought was to talk about how on my tour I walked into a senior math class and one student was solving an equation on another student's leg. But then I realized that that's the whole story. <laughs> After thinking through a couple more ideas, both cliche and not good for some of the audience, I decided that I'm going to talk to you about math. Contrary to popular belief, I think math is super cool. I'm the kind of girl that solved a polynomial division problem on the back of one of those paper menus you get at a Chinese restaurant with the animal signs on them, solely because my dad didn't think that the problem could take up the entire page. I was right, and so was the math problem. Growing up, liking math was the worst thing that you could ever admit to. So, as any middle school girl would, I played along. Yeah, I know, right? That class was the worst. Who cares about numbers and letters and the way numbers and letters come together to equal more numbers and letters? <laughs> it totally isn't interesting at all, and I totally am not going to do the bonus questions he gave us if we wanted more problems to do tonight. I used to lower my test scores by at least 10 points when people asked me what I got so that I could avoid the embarrassment of actually doing well in school. Long story short, my whole charade was revealed when my math teacher told the class that I had the highest test average. I was done for. So I ran away to a tiny school in Beverly that I had never heard of, and as it turned out, they actually liked math. And not only did the students there like math, they liked learning, and the teachers were happy to teach the students, and the students even taught the teachers a lot of the time. I fell in love with school again, and not only was it okay, it was encouraged. Let yourself be the person that wants to do the bonus homework questions, even though you have three other subjects to do. Let yourself push through your fears. That is what I'm showing you today. I am standing up here, giving a speech, when I have been too afraid to even speak at all school meeting for my entire wearing career. It could take time, approximately three years and nine school days if you're like me. 
or it could be your first period on Monday morning. Wearing is not about changing who you are, but about uncovering who you can be. You don't know you're a wearing student yet. You're at wearing because your brothers came here. You've come because your family speaks French. You're here because you love to read, you want to be challenged, and you like to take risks. You don't know you're a writer yet. You've come to wearing full of ideas and aspirations, even if you can't articulate them yet. Maybe you sit in this tent and wonder if you will measure up. You wonder if you will be able to explain what drives you, what inspires you, and what is worth fighting for. Do you have the words or have they all been used up already? You don't know you're an artist yet. Drawing pencils don't fit comfortably in your hand. You drew your very first vase in the middle of the page despite KB's instructions. <laughs> but within the palimpsest of your first, second, hundredth attempt, you have created something worth talking about. You don't know you're a scientist yet. You've never taken so many notes in your life, but now you're driving home anxious and excited to start your first problem set. You begin to ask questions during your very first lab, and you don't know it yet. But that's the beginning of a hypothesis and the beginning of a scientist. You don't know you're an athlete yet. Your basketball sneakers are giving you blisters, and you still don't quite understand the rules of the game. But here you are on the court with your teammate as she sinks six three-pointers, and the balcony of spectators is going wild, and the whole gym starts to shake for your team. You don't know you're a Francophile yet. Your notebooks are littered with verb conjugations that you think you'll never remember, and you're worried you'll never do justice to Christian's name. <laughs> but you find yourself humming Papa Ute while helping your 22 best friends scale the French mountainside tout en rêvant de ta prochaine baguette. You don't know you're a teacher yet, but now you're shepherding group one writers around the school and they're arguing about who gets to read first. And once they quiet down, they look to you. Or maybe you finally step up in humanities and read a bit of your marginalia and Jim starts to smack your classmates' notebooks so that they write down what you said. <laughs> you don't know you're a feminist yet and you never thought you'd be a debater. But maybe you're starting to enjoy the sound of your voice when you make a point. You're starting to work harder just to see that look on that face when you convince an audience. Right now, I want you to know one thing. When you hear the bell that symbolizes your entry to wearing, you become part of a community that believes in you and believes in your ability to become all things. Here is a space where you can pursue your passion, develop your identity, and grow your voice. These bells call to you. Listen. You don't know yet where you will go, but it will be a journey worth taking. they tell us we need to do the serious version as well. For those of you on FaceWeb, you saw the comedic version. <laughs> At Waring, we ask the big questions. Why school? What is the best way to learn? How can we learn from each other? How can we use our imagination and our passion to make lear the learning experience exciting and joyful? At Waring, we learn for learning's sake. Curriculum and content are only the means to a larger end. We learn how to learn, how to lead with open hearts and minds and integrity. We gain the skills and competencies to thrive and emphasize in a diverse, changing world. At Waring, the faculty drive our culture and our mission. Our teachers live out passions through a life calling, a vocation. Superbly qualified, our teachers are able to mix spontaneity and experience and expertise. 
They utilize experiential and progressive pedagogy in their teaching. And in fact, like our students, Waring teachers are always learning. At Waring, diverse ideas spring from a diverse community. Those who are passionate about learning, those who take personal responsibility for their growth, those who have the courage and aptitude for the rigors of Waring's program come from all walks of life. Waring devotes significant resources to ensure that our student population is diverse in all respects. Waring's campus is community oriented. This beautiful, quirky, rustic estate filled with pianos and renovated stables facilitates learning and relationships. Anywhere, everywhere, we see learning in circles, mixed stage participation, from the smallest alcoves of a building to our large open spaces and all school meeting venue. Waring's campus is an organic living and breathing entity. Individuals like living cells comprise a larger dynamic body of learning and being. In 2015, Waring's trustees and faculty published a five year strategic plan committing ourselves to support diversity and affordability through financial aid, to bolstering the supports of our teachers and staff, and to moving forward with a comprehensive master plan. We raised over $500,000 in two years with the Major Gifts Initiative, and then were granted the subsequent $75,000 of permanently endowed funds from grateful parents of students and alums which now facilitates a faculty grants program in, per in perpetuity. That was Vicki Lincoln's brainchild. <laughs> we have had fiscal strength and successful supports for annual fundraising, thanks to the generosity of our community. And if the annual fund is an indicator of the health of an organization, just consider that we have had 100% board and faculty participation annually for several years now. So today, we are positioned to make a transformative announcement that marks a historic moment for the school. With the momentum of our strategic plan and the ensuing major gifts initiative, we've enjoyed widespread support of the community, full support from the community of wearing our direction and our strategic initiatives. Money raised for faculty and students is already in use, already part of the operating budget, already reflected in new teaching positions professional development, and in financial aid and supports for students. We've targeted the first and greatest capital need in our campus master plan, right behind me here, and the designs for an entirely new and sustainable all-school meeting space are well underway with our architect, Marianne Thompson. We therefore officially announce to you today our campaign for wearing, with a goal to raise an historic $6 million from our students, for our students, Faculty. It's those prepositions that get you every time when you're doing public speaking, right? Um, for our students, faculty, and our new school building. To date, through the record-breaking support of donors from all constituencies, as well as from foundation support of Waring's mission, we are excited to announce that we have already raised a remarkable $5.1 million toward our campaign goal. <laughs> $5.1 million has been contributed from some 28 donors during the quiet nucleus fund of this campaign, which began in January. We are thrilled at the momentum, and I am grateful to the entire board of trustees, 100% of whom have given to this campaign already. Through this campaign, in addition to the school building, we continue to raise meaningful funds that support faculty and students to the tune of $200,000 each year, in addition to the annual fund schools 
support of the school's operation. Through this campaign, we will see through the final design and construction of a new school building built to passive house sustainability standards, a first for schools in our region. <laughs> a home for learning with nooks and porches and classrooms and cubbies, cubbies. <laughs> that will merge with and embrace the natural beauty of our campus a building that will have intimate spaces for quiet discussion, a new all-school meeting space that will appropriately and comfortably bring the entire <laughs> school together for our gatherings, a critical shared experience that dates back to the morning meetings with Philip and Jose in Rockport, Massachusetts in the early 70s. The new building will serve as a catalyst to learning and will allow Waring to continue to invite, engage, and connect, inwardly and outwardly symbolizing the very, school, the very soul of Waring School. We call on our entire community to help us as we move forward with these momentous plans. We call on all of you to help us in imagining this wearing school together and to be part of this remarkable, remarkable period in the school's history. Thank you all and stay tuned. Contained within Grace Lynn's When the Sea Turned to Silver, Wearing Summer Reading, 
there is a wonderful short story entitled The Story of the Ginseng Boy. In this adventure, a young girl is sent away from a happy village life with good parents, lakes, fish, and sun to a shadowy forest with gray rock where she is to live with her elderly aunt and uncle. Over time, this old couple, who seem resigned to lead a dull and unhappy existence, take notice that the young girl is leaving the cottage with more frequency and can even be heard laughing and playing off in the distance. Incredulous that the young niece could find happiness or companionship in such joyless environs, environ, I should say, you're swearing, the old couple question her about her solitary amusement. Well, I don't play alone, says the young girl. I have a friend, a boy, a boy in a red hat. The unhappy couple come to understand that their niece's companion is the ginseng boy, a mysterious being dressed in red who, each month during the night of the red moon, turns into a root. Well, the unhappy couple, old couple decide they must procure this ginseng boy and eventually execute a plan, hunting him down while he's in his root form. Bringing him back to their cottage, the old couple place the ginseng boy in a large pot where they bring him to a boil with the ultimate plan to eat him up. Why, after all, if they manage to consume this magic root, of course, they'll be nourished with the vigors of youth. Like the soup over their fire, the couple's scheme thickens, with the aunt and uncle each devising a way to get the other one out of the house so that they could each secretly consume the full share of the root, taking for her and himself all the more of the youthful sustenance. As you can imagine, though, the couple's plans are predictably thwarted when each of them in turn greedily attempts to double-cross the other and in a rather comical twist of events, they trip over their own scheme, even injuring each other in their ill-founded plan. All the while, our ginseng boy now returned to child form, and our young girl eventually escaped from the cottage, leaving the old injured adults behind, our young companions running far, far away, never to be heard from again. So nieces and nephews, ginseng boys and ginseng girls, meander as far and wide, Welcome to Waring. <laughs> Welcome to a place of curious spirit, youth and laughter, meanderers and dreamers. Waring may not, technically speaking, have lakes or many fish, but there is something of a pond, and certainly a stream, and even more certainly, floods. <laughs> and you'll surely find in exploring this land and these old barnyards and stables and greenhouses much more than meets the eye. Welcome to a place where many of the, in the inherent lessons in that ginseng boy story are lived out when we're at our best. Welcome to a community that values agency and authorship of each individual, most of all in our students. A place where we count on, on you young students, along with our faculty, to drive our school, to define a culture, to dream up both the broadest of notions and the daily details. You'll, undoubt you'll undoubtedly find in us, elder folk, <laughs> from time to time, that we may embody some of the unfavorable traits of the aunt and uncle in our story. <laughs> there may be times when we adults will, at worst, trip over our own ill-advised schemes, or at best, be reminded by your voices and actions and natural propensities that there is everywhere the self-propelled will of the student, the natural curiosity and agency in each one of you. The ginseng boy reminds us all to loosen our grips, as Priscilla spoke about, to relinquish some of our control, and to let loose the marvelous dance of youth and learning. And so speaking of elders, and I realize I'm getting older as I even ponder doing the following, I'd like to leave you off with a brief story of time spent with my maternal grandfather, who, old as he was, never resembled that aunt and uncle in our story and who brings a lesson that I think connects with our ginseng story and with the spirit of wearing school. My late maternal grandfather, Erlen Blood, would be 100 years old this fall. He grew up in rural Andover, Maine during the Depression, cross-country skiing his way to school in the winter months like anyone else at that time or from his neck of the woods. During World War II, 
Grandpa Erlen trained and served as a ski medic in the 10th Mountain Division of the war, stationed somewhere in the northern Italian Alps, where I can only begin to imagine the scenes and the stories. Many of those 10th Mountain Division soldiers actually returned to, to found the Nordic uh, ski centers and downhill ski centers we know today. My grandfather was not such an entrepreneur, though, but what he brought back from the war was a life, lifelong, he, he came back, he returned a lifelong Nordic skier, even becoming a medalist in the Lake Placid Masters at one point, passing down to his family over many winters a lifetime love for the serene backcountry woods and the exhilarating pastime of Nordic cross-country skiing. My wife, Andrea, and I were fortunate enough to have some precious overlapping years with Grandpa in Bethel, Maine. Even though he was by then in his late 80s, Grandpa Erling taught us the intricacies of freestyle skate skiing, including the pr precise technique to skate up steep hills without stepping or herringboning, as they call it, and the art of meticulously waxing skis. But what, what remains most more than anything else from those winter lessons with Grandpa Erlin, is his careful description of a particular state of physical and mental being, a state achieved in the rarest moments when one's intense, most heightened efforts will almost without notice transform into an effortlessness, a suspension of all calculation, all detail. Grandpa called this rare moment abandon. When the skier is in such a state of perfect synchronous strides that the little details vanish from the mind, each movement becoming part of a subconscious whole, each glide an instinctual response to, it, to its antecedent gesture. This is what distant runners experience at mile 10 or 11 or 24, when an initial preoccupation with each and every stride is gradually replaced by the indescribable feeling of wind on the face. It is the pianist whose fingers no longer matter to the mind, the debater whose detailed preparation transforms into instinctive rebuttals, the teacher whose class notes lie on the table unseen while students lose themselves in a discussion of the Odyssey or Euclid's proof to the Pythagorean theorem. The paradox inherent in the state of abandon is that while it can only be achieved through practice, skill, and intense effort, it is also by, defini by definition effortless, unplanned, unordered, completely unencumbered by any constraint. So like our young niece and her ginseng boy companion, youthful souls liberated from controls and from confinement, we are called together today, poets, scientists, art artists, and Nordic skiers of all ages to join our newest wearing students in the joy and in the abandon of learning. Thank you. It's now time for the most momentous announcement the inscription ceremony for our new students with their presenters. So I would ask, uh, first of all, that we refrain, we hold our applause until all the students have been announced. And let it start. Um, I'll ask the first row of presenters and new students to please rise. Theo Van Allen presenting Eli Baer. Hilton introducing Paolo Calderaro. DJ Chase presenting Miranda Cotlin Holland.
Gabe Dowd presenting all of Lines McLean. Eladila Point presenting Lola Prendergast. <laughs> Ella Dole's presenting Harry Strunk. Griffin Wells presenting Sebastian Wells. <laughs> Owen Cooper presenting Daniel Levin. Andrea Weiler presenting Vienna Weiler. <laughs> Grace Laverty presenting Alexandra Brevdi. Brendan Braxter presenting Burrell Clary. <laughs> Amanda Coram presenting Don Blue Joda. Sarah Patey presenting Charlie Pound. <coughs> Vaughn D'Angelo presenting James Curran. Ethan Trowbridge presenting Cecily Trowbridge.
Molly Pershing presenting Elena Bear. <laughs> Nick Van Allen presenting Lucas Carmona. Julie Durning presenting Catherine Goodkind. Georgia Nurse presenting Caroline Hopkins. Daniel Gurr presenting Rowan Malatesta. Cordelia Rose Merrick presenting Sophia Mustone. Keanu Prescott presenting Eli Morrison. Oh, no. <laughs> Ian Morrison. Sophia Boy presenting Inez Ricciuti. Luna Schiller presenting Noah Schiller. Ursula Siegfried presenting Georgia Siegfried. <laughs> Julia Exter, class of 2014, presenting Max Exter. <laughs>
Cole Sauter presenting Neyu Zo. Ella Bernard presenting Sarah Obang.